Hi. Yep. Uh, Walter got me. There you go. We're doing okay now. It was pretty mild, but it was the first time I think it entered our home. So, okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Brother Randy. There he comes. <laughs> uh, for uh, covering for me last week and kind of uh, touching on some of the things of, of Moses and the um, things that he brought up. Uh, I enjoyed very much watching from my sofa at home. So it was, um, anyway, hopefully got our juices going because that's kind of where we're going to pick up. So my, for those who might just be tuning in, my class is on what does it mean to believe on the name of Jesus? And this is a something that uh, gets taken very lightly, as we've talked about in the past, that there is a whole lot to what it means, not just to acknowledge Jesus' existence and that he's your Savior, but to believe uh, in a, a number of things, which, of course, is the gospel. And uh, for the last couple of weeks, I've been taking us on a journey of, of how the gospel was revealed through Scripture. It's not just something that started with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as some people uh, think that I've talked to, they, they don't realize it started all the way, the gospel started in the Garden of Eden. And uh, so that's where we are, and we've been going through several people. We looked at, um, of course, the Garden of Eden. We looked at uh, Abraham quite extensively. He took a couple of weeks there. And today, uh, I'm going to pick up with Moses, and I've got some things that are uh, a, a little different than where Randy went, but uh, it all goes together. So we're going to start about how we find the name of Jesus Christ and the things concerning the kingdom of God in Moses' day. So let's go ahead and start here. Uh, Matt, why don't you go ahead and read this one? Deuteronomy 18, 13 to 15. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God, for these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Okay. This is the first uh, place that we get where Jesus is referred to as what? A prophet. Remember, what are the three positions that he holds for those who might not be as familiar with it? Prophet, priest, and king. Right. And this is, the best I can tell, and I'm always open for being corrected on this as you go through Scripture, this see, appears to be the first place that we find this word prophet attached to the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ. And again, this is that journey through Scripture of the, of the Old Testament of how the gospel was being revealed every, every few, sometimes every few hundred years, we would get another piece of the gospel given to us. And this is the richness of the Old Testament. Now, if you notice, we're in Deuteronomy. And in, this is uh, Deuteronomy. We're near the end of Moses' time. That's why he's bringing this up. I'm going to be uh, disappearing here soon. I'm going to die, as we know that how that all took place. So God took him up into the mountain and, and buried him. Um, but the warnings here about following, if you look at some of the other verses uh, just before it, he was warning them as about these nations that you overthrow and that you start to control, is that there's, they've got their diviners, they've got witches, they've got necromancers, all those words are in there. I just didn't put it all on here. That they're going to conquer. And Moses didn't, and he's telling them, like, you do not involve yourself in these um, these type of uh, sorceries and, and superstitions like that. Um, so uh, here he said, how is, if this is referring to Christ, and we're going to look at a little more detail in the next slide, how is this prophet like Moses? He's going to be like Moses. Yeah, wait for the mic. Yeah. Sorry. He'll be a deliverer. Right. He will, will be. Also, I see a couple. Oh, here, hands are going up all over the place. He'll be able to go between 
people and God, right? So he has a special position where he's a mediator right. and an, an intercessor and a liaison from man to God. Right, that's good. I, I actually will be getting to that in another few slides, but that's good. Uh, I saw, I think Jason had his hand up again. Mediator can have a couple different ways to look at it. So Jesse had one side of it. The other is somebody who brings something to uh, people, right? So Moses was the mediator of the first covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He brings to the people uh, what God wants. Okay, good. If these are things that a lot of people would miss when Moses talked about a prophet. Uh, if you don't know your scripture and you, and you don't feel that the Old Testament is important, you could read right over this and think, well, some guy's going to come along right after Moses. You might think it's Joshua or someone like that. But it's more than that. Now, we go on with these verses, same verses, same string of verses, continuing on. Um, uh, Brian, would you read this, please? We'll get more detail. And the Lord said unto me, they have spoken well that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Okay. This is some really some detail here of the, the authority. I look at this, it tells of, of recognizing, first of all, um, he's given them things so that when he does come, and of course they did not know. For all they knew, he was going to come in a few years or as soon as Moses died. Or, but as we know, it was uh, something like 1,300 years. I forget what's the distance between Moses and Christ. I know it's like 1,300 years uh, or something like that. So he, he's not going to really come for quite a while, but they don't know that. So they should always be looking for this prophet that's coming. And as we can see, it is critical that they recognize him as that prophet. Uh, as we saw when Christ did finally come, how much he was trying to convince them that I am that prophet. This is a very serious verse. When you really think about all that the children of Israel have been through and how they constantly fell and they, they rebelled and things like that, and we're told that they would continue. Moses knew and told them, I know that after I'm gone, you're going to continue to do these things. Uh, uh, Randy, go ahead. And in Jesus' day, they were looking for this prophet because they asked John the Baptist if he was it. Uh -huh. Yeah, they, there were some that, that were looking for him to come, but try, they, they couldn't recognize Jesus as that prophet. Um, but as you can see, um, how serious this verse is. And I've, I've read over it many times and until I actually sat down and, and underlined things like I have here. This shows the authority that would be laid upon the, the prophet uh, when he comes and the importance of keeping his commandments, and all of them. He says, whosoever will not hearken, I will require it of him. So this is not something he's just, you can take it or leave it what he says. It doesn't matter, you know, if you can absorb what you can and forget the rest. This is absolutely critical to them receiving him. Listening and obeying, of course, for us, it's the same way. For our future existence, we know that uh, many of them perished in the wilderness because they wouldn't listen to Moses, um, because they wouldn't obey what God said. And for our future existence in the kingdom, it's critical that we obey his commandments and keep them. As it says, these things will be required of us when we, we stand before uh, the judgment. Uh, <clears throat> so... Um, all right. Um, what other symbol? Okay, there's a symbol in um, Moses' day that takes us to the crucifixion. Does anybody know what that is? Joe? There, there's a lot of those wonderful um, iconography, like the snake and the serpent in the tree in the Garden of Good and Evil, um, which is also you see with the bronze serpent that was later known as Nahashtu, and it survived for 700 years and was worshipped in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the bronze serpent, and then when David chops off the head of Goliath and sticks it on a pole outside Jerusalem, it becomes known as Golgotha, 
So those are three really strong iconography that helps you understand how Christ was going to die. Um, and they're from the, the Genesis account, from the Exodus mm -hmm. account, and from one of the major kings of Israel. Okay, good. Well, the one I was going to do is the uh, serpent. Uh, this is a, a very, to me, I, I, the two I'm going to show, I think, are, it's at least during Moses' time. In his, his time frame, probably, the, I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about two of the things that really, really pointed to Christ. Uh, in some detail, and and this is uh, of course the first one, and we got to read this slide here to get the uh, background of how we get to this bad situation. Uh, Mike, would you read this? Wait for the Mike. Wait for the mic. Numbers twenty one five, and the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Okay, so this is the context of what we're going to look at here of, of why this was uh, uh, put in place, this serpent. So um, the, the story continues. Uh, uh, Rob, would you read this? Continuing verse 6 of Numbers 21. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Okay, so here they realize their error, because all these snakes are biting them. They've come out of the woodwork. No telling how many hundreds or thousands of snakes. You can imagine how frightening that would be. If where, everywhere you walk, there's snakes, Tr not just going by. You know, snakes don't usually attack you. They, they only, they will defend themselves, but they don't attack so much except their own prey. But these snakes were coming for the specific per reason to bite you. Uh, John. One of the things, uh, sort of the preamble to all this is, is they had just been delivered. Like um, the reason why the serpents came is they had been delivered from a situation. There was something required of them. They had to take a journey. Mm -hmm. And it was on this journey, after just being delivered, after just being saved, um, spared by the Lord from you know, what they would have faced, then they started to grumble again. And that's why he sent the serpents, because he was just done. Here he had delivered them yet again. Mm -hmm. And instead of re recognizing the fact that they would have to have some skin in the game and something might be required of them, in this deliverance, they would have to take this journey. They focused on how arduous the journey was and they started to grumble. And it was then that he sent the serpents. Mm -hmm. So it was in reaction to their lack of faith. Right, right. They, they didn't just come out of nowhere and start biting them. Hey, hey, Lord, help us out here. We got snakes all over the place. The Lord sent the snakes. Um, but here, this is the thing that Jesse made uh, that what is Moses being here in this? What is the position? What did they ask and what did Moses do? This is interceding right. between he's the, mediator. the Lord and the people. This is where he's being that mediator and, and fitting that role of the future prophet to come. Joe? I think it's also interesting. The people asked and then Moses asked to remove the snakes. That's not at all what happened. God's solution was the snakes are going to remain, but here's the solution. So it's a shock to us because many times we're always having to ask for the removal of something from our lives. And instead, God says, I'm not going to remove it, but here's the solution. Um, the other thing I was going to say was I've always wondered what kind of snake it was. Um, and they are, a lot of people put a lot of time and research into it. And one of them says, you know, it says in the Bible, it's a fiery flying serpent. Um, and what Israel saw was a uh, scale viper or carpet viper that basically, it's, it's just incredible. It lives in the Ar Arava Valley. Um, so I just thought that was really interesting. What do you mean by a carpet? I mean, what's different about it? I don't, I've never heard that. Before. It's more aggressive, I guess, than um, other snakes are. I mean, I wouldn't want to see it at all. There's a picture of it, if you want to see. But it's just, it was just really interesting because it lives in that specific area. 
but they they have those two metaphors to describe the snake um that it was you know it was aggressive it pursues you like sin does mm -hmm. um and there's it's very difficult to escape so i just thought that was interesting to to know what kind of serpent we're talking about okay that's interesting i hadn't heard that one variety <laughs> uh john's got his hand up again and then justin um i think one of the clues to why it wasn't you know removed is if as joe said um you know this the serpent is and the effects of the serpent is representative of sin that sin is pervasive sin bites everyone um sin is flowing through us sin will ultimately lead to death as this venom from the serpents would with these people then he wouldn't remove it i i, I mean christ will remove that and if this is a type of christ then um you know there is deliverance from it temporarily because these people eventually did die um but the ultimate you know salvation from it would be through christ and it wasn't the time for christ yet mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to corroborate what joe said S snakes have personalities and some of them lay around some of them are very aggressive and will chase you in particular the copperhead here will not chase you the water moccasin can and sometimes does but uh, in, they have the, the Palestinian viper in that area accounts for more bites than any other in the Palestine area. And it's, I think it's the national viper of Israel. But uh, anyways. <laughs> national viper of Israel. Boy, there's a, I'll go with the uh, condor or something. <laughs> Anyone else? That's all good stuff. It's, it's, yeah, I've picked up a couple of things I hadn't uh, thought about before. I'd mostly thought about the only aggressive, real aggressive snakes that would, let's say, hunt you would be something like a 20-foot long anaconda or something like that. The other ones I've generally understood, you know, if you walk up on them, they'll defend themselves, and that's when you get bit. Uh, not that they would chase you down the street, but I guess there are a few of those snakes that do exist, and I, I'm not familiar with them, but that's interesting history of what, what might have happened here. All right, so, but the story goes on. We, let's, uh, no one else on that. Um, who's next there? Uh, Jason, I think you're next to read. Numbers 21.8, and the Lord said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and he put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay, so here we have that, how can you be saved? There's a process that had to go through. It's like um, someone was saying, I think it was Joe, that the snakes didn't just go away. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the plagues in Egypt, all the flies just flew away, all the frogs just died. You know, they just stopped dead in the water. But uh, they had to physically make an effort to get to that pole and um if you know if you've been snake bit that may be hard to do <laughs> if you've been bitten in the leg or something you may be having trouble even walking uh, and you're you're really dying uh with it. so we don't know what how much effort it would take to get to that pole uh jake it's just something interesting that uh, i don't know if it's ever struck me before if it's just because we're talking about it right now but the fact that Moses makes a uh, serpent. He doesn't use any other uh, creature. He uses a serpent. And it kind of gives, at least for me, an image of Christ just in the fact that Christ was like us. He had to deal with the sin that was inside of him that was coursing through his veins. And he was able to fight that. And because we look to him, we're able to overcome it. And the idea of how it became an idol it's interesting when you think about how Christ has somehow become, a, or at least the cross itself has become an idol for some people. Go. The other piece of the puzzle is Hezekiah was the one who finally removed them, removed Nehushtan from worship, but <coughs> it was a problem in Canaan before they came into the land. They actually had cults that worshiped snakes in Medego, Gezer, um, Shechem, and Ekron, and Hazor. 
So that was part of the reason God said, don't follow what's being done in the land. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the people, get rid of this whole situation because otherwise you'll be tempted to do it. And then it's picked up again in two places in Revelations 12, 9 and 20, uh, verse 7, which actually makes the strong comparison of the devil or Satan connected with um, the serpent, meaning that sin can can chase and pursue us all. Um, the, the last thing was, is just think of the human terror of being chased by a snake, bitten by a snake and trying to get it off of you. I can't even imagine the terror of that. And I think God wanted to make that point is that you should be just as terrorized by sin and what it can do to you. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about that, just if, if you're in your tent, you got it sealed up. You've got to go out now, even just to use the bathroom or whatever. Every step of the way, you would be watching every step you took in the dark. I, I don't want to steal your thunder if you're going there. Um, are you planning on going to John chapter 3? Yes. You are? Yep. Okay. Next well, slide. Then. All right. Then. I am not going to say anything. <laughs> okay. Don't anybody say anything about John chapter 3. <laughs> um, I just think it's very, you know, hearing Joe speak about you know, how they kept it as a um, idol for all those years, uh -huh. the, the snake on the, on the pole. Um, it really shows that, you know, it's always been through Christ alone, right? And the law was a means by which people would be delivered, but it ultimately was Christ who was the, the head of that, right? The alpha and the omega, like we talked about this morning. So it was... You know, whether it was that pole or the ram in the thicket or all these different ways that come about that are temporary and then the law was so long term, but you know, you have all these other means by which people kind of were symbolically delivered, but all of them point to Christ. And I know that's a pretty obvious statement, but it's just a, a good example of how, you know, even with like the Jews in the New Testament holding on to the law for so long and certain parts of the law because they couldn't understand that it was Christ. Well, they were even doing that with the snake on the pole when that was really no longer necessary because mm -hmm. of its specific purpose. Yeah, the snakes it were all gone. Yeah. You didn't need the snake. Uh, I saw another hand. Oh, Jesse. This is a real quick anecdote, but I caught a snake once, it was a green snake, and, and I was talking to a fellow, I saw it in the bush, and I just grabbed it because it's little and I know it can't hurt me. Well, the guy that was in front of me that I was talking to completely flipped out, like, and because he, he didn't have the realization that I did that, that sin, you know, it's not going to lead to death, that, that snake can't hurt me. And the snake was trying to bite me, and I couldn't even feel it because it was only yeah, very small. Green snakes. And once Christ is involved and once mercy is involved, that's the way we can look at snakes. They, they can't kill you. They, you know, with the, with the proper repentance and, and the uh, mindset, you can realize that the sin can be overcome and you can move on past it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. These, these are good thoughts. Um, okay. uh, here comes my thunder. As nobody stole my thunder here. Let's go. Here's the whole purpose of, of what I'm doing. Um, why isn't this moving? Oh, there it goes. Um, again, the Old Testament pointed to the new, and the new looks back. So, um, Julia, would you read this? And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, there's the, the, there's the, the connection to all of this of the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. That pointed to Christ, that he's, he's made that connection uh, in talking to them uh, and trying to explain who he was. And here um, we get that, let's say, binding tie between the two books, the two testaments here. And, and I, I just, as to me, I was kind of thinking about this if, uh, with, you know, we can acknowledge Christ we can go through all the services and everything, but if we don't believe, truly believe, we would still lose our salvation. And I wonder if in that day, if the people, even though they might have gone to that serpent and looked at it, if they didn't really believe it would heal them, 
would they have been healed? It's just, that's not scriptural. It's just something I thought about when you think about you can acknowledge Christ but not believe in him. Do we have to go again? Yeah. Um, in the account in Deuteronomy or, um, about the serpent, they, they were told, you know, the only way to not die from the poison is to look up and acknowledge this bronze serpent. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because that was uh, an icon of lesson for the Jews and with Christ and his death, nobody wanted to look up. Nobody wanted to, to see the shame mm -hmm. or what had happened to him on, on the cross and they backed away from it completely. Um, so the next time they see him, you know, they're going to have to acknowledge him. And that's, I think, in Zechariah 12, where it says they're going to look up on him whom they've pierced, and they're going to mourn. And it's the opposite of the Passover, where in the Passover, they were spared and the Egyptians lost their firstborn. In Zechariah 12, it says each house will mourn by itself, just like the Passover because they're going to be forced to look up and acknowledge him mm -hmm. where they did it in the wilderness, but they wouldn't do it when he was alive. But in the end, they're still going to have to do it. So it's the mer merging of this uh, along with the Passover. Very good. Very good. Uh, Jace, Jace? When you read this particular passage and you also take a look at the passage that uh, we referred to earlier, you don't think of this as an object lesson of love, but that's what Christ does, right? So he, he brings this out to Nicodemus, and then arguably the most famous verse in the Bible is directly after this, John three sixteen, right? Oh, For yeah. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That follows this story. Very good. I right, so, I so why, why does this follow the story? Right? Why does God's love directly follow the serpent, the snake, the, the bronze snake on the cross? Christ's son is also, or God's son, Christ, is on the cross. Mm -hmm. And God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth, and you had asked before, he have to believe in order to make this happen? Yes. Yeah. Right? I think so. Whoever believes, shall have eternal life. So that, this story is interconnected to one of the most fundamental things in the Bible. Very good. I, I, I'm going to add that verse on. It just didn't even register with me to put that verse, but I'm going to add that to it. Thank you, Dave. Very good. Um, now, just go back to where all this old serpent, uh, Genesis 315, we can't, Without reading, we got to read this if we're going to look at this story. Uh, Bill, I think you're next. And I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between the, thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Very, the whole thing, when this serpent thing came into play, it was right here. And we can see we're standing where Moses is, is a shadow backwards and the shadows forward. It's a, a beautiful story, just like Jason has al already enriched it a little more. And they were bitten because of their sin, but through the symbology of the crucifixion that's here, they were saved. Um, and this is specifically, these, these things are specifically, and I really push this because I realized how much a, a lot of people don't understand it. These things are the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ from one end of the scriptures to the other. And this serpent on the pole is one of those things concerning the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Because we had Israel there that was in the, the mustard seed of the kingdom, so to speak. It's all right there in that one horrific moment. So uh, the, the beauty of this, this uh, journey through his uh, scriptures is amazing. All right, now there's another uh, symbol. that I, What? Oh, okay, uh, back in Numbers, where it says, look at the serpent, the word means gaze. You've got to look at it for a long time. Like, you've got to look at Christ for a long time to, to really be saved by that. Oh, okay. Very good. Another little nuance there to 
they didn't just have to look up, okay, I'm fine, I'm out of here, I feel better. They had to perhaps, kind of like this picture, you see them there, they're just looking at it and not running away or anything like that. So uh, thank you for all of y'all for that. All right, another symbol of Christ that we're going to look at here. Uh, we all know what this is uh, very much. This is the tabernacle in the wilderness. And of course, this is again during um, Moses' time. He was commissioned to, to have this built. But there's one particular thing that was always impressive to me uh, about this that pointed to Christ very strong. Now, the whole thing points to Christ. There's no, no doubt about that. I mean, we could sit here and have classes and classes on what everything represented. And I'm only going to look at really one thing. Um, um, there, oh, let me uh, bring up the verse. Let's see, who's next to read? Who's next? Whoever's next? Robert? Or? Exodus 36, 8. And every wise-hearted man among them that wrought the work of the tabernacle made ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of running work made he them. Okay. We might read over this real quick and say, boy, that was, I'm sure it was very pretty. Beautiful thread, colors, and all. In this account, when he was giving uh, this about how to build this, and when he was going through all the curtains and, and, the, and the embroidery, there is a total of 26 verses, and this surprised me. I just looked it up. Uh, there are 26 verses where we find blue, purple, and scarlet concerning the building of the tabernacle. It's not just a couple of times in a couple of places about something to look nice. Uh, it was everywhere in this tabernacle. There was blue, purple, and scarlet. What I thought, uh, this was just impressive to me. I'm sure everyone has things about the tabernacle that are interesting to them. But what I wanted to do is look at these colors. Um, so we'll take them in order. What, what did blue represent? Does anybody know? What's that? No? Uh, what, what did you say, Matt? No? Not, well, close. So. Well, the three different colors, blue, I, I always thought represented healing, and the red represented uh, sin atone for, and the purple was his royalty, but... All right. Well, I'm going to give verses that show what each one meant, because it is told us, all right, blue represented God's law. And if you would, I don't have it on a, a slide, but uh, who's next to read? Uh, I want to read Numbers 15, 38 through 40. Whoever's next. Number, I'm sorry, Numbers 15, 38 through 40. I wouldn't put it on the screen, but it was too much to juggle back and forth. So. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, throughout the generations to come, you are make tassels on the corners of your garments with the blue cord. On each tassel, you will have these tassel. I can't see. I'm sorry. Cord. Each tassel, you will have these tassels to look at, and to you will remember all the commandments of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by going after the lust of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commandments, and I will be consecrated to your God, and I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so there it was about keeping his commandments, his law, uh, that was... Given. So blue represents, the best I can tell from the scripture is it, it was 
for them to remember God's law. And you remember they always had the blue uh, was on there, I think, as that said. But we see blue in all of the, the clothing that they have, so to speak. All right. So uh, the purple, um, we look at that. That purple uh, represented royalty. And if we would, uh, for, uh, let's read Mark 15, 17 through 18. Mark 15, 17 through 18. And they dressed him up in purple, and after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to acclaim him. Hail, King of the Jews. Okay. So uh, doing, I've done some study on the emperors and all in, in Rome in that time. The, the wearing purple showed that you were in high authority. And the, the, the emperors always wore purple. It's just historically that way. So they're putting on him, Christ, this purple robe or whatever it was, and then calling him Hail, King of the Jews. They're actually in trying to insult him, of course. But uh, here we get that uh, um, where purple represents royalty in, in, in the scriptures. So in the last one, blue, purple, and scarlet is the uh, color used to represent flesh or sin. And if we would, let's go to um, uh, Isaiah one eighteen. Isaiah one eighteen, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Okay, so there we get sin is compared to these, the color of red, scarlet, and crimson, which are very, very red colors. So um, what we're seeing there, we see God's law, a king, and flesh, sin, uh, being... Of course, Christ had flesh as we did, and we, he had to be redeemed of that himself. And if you take, what color do you get if you put blue and scarlet together? If you mix them, you get purple, you get a, the royalty. So what we see here is right down into the stitching, and it was very prominent in here, is, is Christ. We see Christ here with the, the blue, the purple, and scarlet all point to Christ. And it was in everything. It was woven into every fabric, every curtain. It's just, it's an amazingly beautiful thing. He didn't just sit, pick these colors because I thought they would look nice or they'd match there in robe or something like that. Everything in here had a purpose that pointed to something to come. And I just, I just picked this one thing about the tabernacle because it always, I did a, a study on the colors of the rainbow uh, years ago. And uh, these colors just now jump off the page at me every time I read them. Of the order that they're in the rainbow is the same as the order that they're here also. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful um, shadow of Christ. Uh, uh, Dan? I was just looking up a little more, and one other reference mentions that uh, blue can also represent heavenliness, and which kind of goes along with God's yeah, law as the well. the blue sky. Yeah, yeah. so in, um, just to kind of go with that, Exodus 24.10, And they saw the God of Israel, there was under his feet, as it were, pavement of sapphire stones, and the very heaven for clearness. And I think that goes along with the analogy that you're making, that this, this royalty is very much Christ, you know, that, that marrying of heavenliness with the sin in the flesh, which is Christ, you know, right. representation of God in the flesh. What, what better color for the sky to be blue? You know, we have to look up to see it and, you know, and on a clear blue day like yesterday. It was just as blue as it could be. There's hardly a cloud in the sky, at least in my house for a while. And it's just, it's an amazing, we look up and uh, see it. And that's what we should remember is our Lord and all. So, um, 
Okay. Um, I got um, one more thing here uh, on Moses. There's so much on Moses, pretty much taking up the class. But um, let's see, who's next to read? Then he, Jesus, said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Okay, right there, that verse should tell us the value of the Old Testament, where Christ told his story to them. What, what, was, the sto what was happening here? What was the situation? Randy? Uh, two disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection. Right, and what was their state of mind? They couldn't believe that he didn't know about the crucifixion of of Jesus. Right, they were they were very sad. Yeah. They were sad. They were sad that we thought he was the one and, and all. <laughs> he's, he's walking right there with them, you know, and they don't even realize it. And so he starts, look where he starts, beginning at Moses. Uh, Rebecca. I'm sorry, just a quick thought. Isn't that just like us, though? He's walking right there with us mm -hmm. every single day. Yep. But we don't see it. We don't feel it in the midst of whatever trial and right. challenge. And their struggle. Yeah, they were hurting really bad. They thought the Messiah had come. He'd done miracles. He'd raised the dead. And now he's dead. What on earth happened? It's like, a, it's like a, an emotional train wreck that they were going through. Or maybe a camel wreck in their day. I don't know. It was, uh, uh, it was horrible. And they were, he, but it's, it's where he started. That's why I bring in this verse. He started right at Moses. Look at the things we've looked at at Moses. He probably talked about that serpent on the pole. He probably talked about the time. We don't know what he said. They probably walked for a long way, but you can imagine him going through these stories that they would have known so well. Uh, maybe the stitching in the, in the tabernacle. I don't know but uh, how much he told them. Uh, but that's where he started concerning himself. So we, he makes the whole understanding of the Old Testament pointing to him. And if, if you take that Old Testament and say it's no longer value, imagine what you're nullifying. The very thing that Christ talked about to prove that he was the Christ. That's the seriousness of that. All right, I, I got us out of time. Is there any, any more questions for uh, Stacy? I've talked too much already, but what Randy talked about, you have to look, you have to concentrate on the serpent on the cross. The, the word there is nabat, and you might go, okay, well, what does that mean? How, how do you concentrate on it? That's the same word that's used for Lot's wife when she looks back at Sodom and Gomorrah, nabat. She, she turns around and she longs for it. She gazes at it with, with desire, right? So when, when we look at the cross, uh, it is the same for us. We, we ought to not think of it as a, a small thing, but uh, what, what a great loss. What this thing that, that uh, is so important, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's, once again, tied to John 3.16. Thank you. All of your comments were just amazing to me. I, I had no idea that <laughs> we would get that. Much. Oh, but they're still going. Yeah, I just had one more. <laughs> Um, I was just thinking about on the road when Jesus is, you know, telling them all the things concerning himself. He's probably also commenting back on some of the things he said along his, you know, on, along his ministry that they didn't understand at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think when we read the New Testament, we, we 